season's greetings and a very warm welcome to what we hope will be a very special edition of Something Rhymes With Purple. This is a podcast where Susie Dent and I meet up each week to talk about words and language. And we're so grateful to you for joining us. We're very lucky. We've had a very happy year with Something Rhymes With Purple. Uh, We've had four million downloads so far, which is fantastic. And we won a prize this year, Best Entertainment Podcast, the Gold Award, which was pretty exciting. And it's all, frankly, down to the people who tune in and listen. So thank you very much for being there. This is a week between Christmas and New Year, and you gave a lovely word for it, didn't you, the other day? I can't remember what that word was. There's lots of them. Some people call it Twixtmas, which is quite nice. But the one I like the best, just because it makes me laugh, is the Merineum, because like the Perineum, it kind of bridges two things. I like that. Well, I like, at Christmas time, I like to play games. So I thought we'd begin today by playing a few games And I'm going to introduce you to a couple of games. And I hope they're games that people can play as well. So I'm going to introduce you to games that we can play with the family or games that you can play on your own. And also there's some riddles. I came across, we were talking about Victorian literature last week, and I came across a book of Victorian riddles with a linguistic feel to them. And I wonder if you can answer any of these uh, riddles, Susie Dent. What grammatical term is unpopular with young lovers? (laughs) <laughs> what grammatical term is unpopular with young lovers? Uh, sp- split infinitive. Don't know. The third person. <laughs> oh, very good. Boom, boom. Very That's good. quite neat, isn't it? In what sort of syllables ought a parrot to speak? Don't know. Uh, I hope the people listening are <laughs> shouting out uh, uh, at their um, earphones. In what sort of syllables uh, should a, what a parrot to speak? Not mono. Polysyllables. 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 Oh, syllables. I believe uh, I didn't get that one. I know. Polly means... I don't, why do people say uh, call a parrot Polly? It's interesting, isn't it? Uh, it's just because we love giving first names to birds. So we have the robin, we have the parrot itself, which goes back to Pierre, Pierrot, which is, means little Peter. We have the magpie, in which the mag is short for Margaret. And similarly, Polly. So Polly actually was the term for a parrot for quite a long time. Oh, God, you called it a, you called it a Polly, yeah. not a parrot? Yeah. Goodness. And poly also means multiple, as, it does, as with in one L. Yes. polysyllable. Yes. When can you recognise the naked truth? I'm looking for a pun here. When, when can you recognise the naked truth? Uh, when you're given the bare facts. Oh. <laughs> Honestly, in I what, need more time for these. They're brilliant. It, no, you don't. I mean, they're, they're, they're Christmas cracker uh, <laughs> stuff. Christmas cracker and invented in Victorian times. Tom Smith, 1843. <laughs> you won't be surprised to know when I was young, I actually wrote the riddles for Christmas crackers. I'm not at all surprised. Yeah. <laughs> in your Christmas My favorite, jumpers. Uh, the, the one that was banned, they wouldn't run it, was the one that said, what does the Queen do when she burps? She issues a royal pardon. Boom, boom. Oh. In what colour should a secret be kept? This is quite clever. What in what colour? Oh, I can't think. Panicking. In violet. Oh, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. You know, as with all quiz questions, they, they're easy when you know the answer, impossible yeah. when you I'm don't. I'm very close to the poly one. I should easily have got that one. When is longhand quicker than shorthand? Um... When is longhand quicker than shorthand? There are people out there walking the dogs and listening to us. <laughs> Shouting thinking, oh, at me, for heaven's sake, yeah, Susie. Exactly. It's been a when long time, haven't we? Long hand. Well, I'll give you a clue. I'll rephrase it. When is a long hand quicker than a short hand? When it's on a clock. Oh. But, of course, maybe nowadays people don't see a clock with the hands going No, around. do you know, there's an amazing fact that actually so many kids these days have no idea how to tell the time from a traditional clock because it's all digital. Why is a joke like a coconut? Because it's a bit shy. <laughs> <laughs> that's no, quite nice, as in a coconut shy. Uh, well, that's no, good, coconut. because it's no use till it's been cracked. Oh, very good, very, very good. Very good. Let's play a game. Do you know the game Donkey? This is an actual game that people can play over Christmas. You can play it any, any number of people. The idea of this game, it's, again, it's a Victorian game, and it, it's you, you have to spell a word. It can't be a three-letter word, don't count. Uh, you don't want to be the person finishing the word. You mustn't finish the word, you lose a life. There are six lives to lose, uh, and when you've lost, you become a D after you lose your first life, then a D-O, then a D-O-N, then a K-E-Y. You eventually end up as a donkey, donkey, okay? So we're going to spell a word, taking it in turns. So I would I like gotcha, say... I gotcha, gotcha. I'll say G. Yeah. And you'll say what? A. 
A, good. If I said P, that wouldn't count, though gap is a word. I see. It's got to be a longer than three-letter word. I see. So go on spelling. So I've said G-A-P, yes, what's your next letter? I. N. Uh, okay, so if I add G, I've lost, right? Yeah, yeah you've said gaping okay. and you've lost. You've added G, you've lost, I so you're a donkey. Okay. okay. If you're very strategic, you just count up the number of letters that you're going for, don't you? Because you narrow it well, down to one word that can't, can't be escaped from. Well, yes, but the, 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 the language is so rich. I mean, you know, that Oxford English Dictionary you've got, it's got half a million words yeah. in it, hasn't it? Yeah, or more. And yeah. so the, the, the possibility is endless. Okay. They're more limited when there are just two people playing, yeah. of course, because you can work out alternate letters. When it gets to three people playing, it becomes more complicated, and it's a great game to play in the car uh, or around the table with all the family. Let's bring in part of our family. It's Lawrence, our producer. Lawrence, you've got the idea, you've worked out the rules of Donkey. Do you understand how we play the game? I have worked out the rules. Can I ask, are you allowed to put L-Y on the end of words? I know. I'd like to do adverbs. Yes, but... yes you can, of course. As long as you haven't finished the word before you get That's there. That's the thing, Lawrence, because you, you, have... you will have already got the adjective. Absolutely. Yes. You've already got absolute. So. Yes. Exactly. I think I've got it, Giles. I think, yeah, got I the think idea. I'm going I'm to compete with you. I think you're going to be quite good on this. Good. OK. I'm starting this word. Then it's Susie. Then it's Lawrence. Okay. F for Freddy. A. B. Fab, but three letter words don't count, so well done you. You. L. O. You. This is very unfair of you there, Lawrence. You set me up for that one because I've got nowhere to go. Um, okay. Um, I think there is. Is there? Oh, but maybe, no, I think maybe there isn't. I was thinking that possibly Fabuloso. I was thinking Fabuloso. I was going to have Fabuloso, but I still have to put the S in, don't I? So I'm the donkey again. That was unfair, guys. Okay, another, another round. You begin this round. Me? Okay. Um, H. Okay. H, I will follow with a simple A. R. B. O. U. Honestly, <laughs> this yeah. is just, you have set this is, me up. Listeners, isn't this marvellous? The world's leading lexicographer <laughs> no, is playing a children's, a Victorian the children's game, words. and she's losing hands down. This is this all is to what, do with this, the length of This is what words. most people want, Susie, is to beat Dictionary Corner. That's what we're all in. I know, but I don't have a choice. I have nowhere to go. I've been You set have nowhere up. to go but to give us the letter R. Harbour. We've not planned this beforehand. No. no. May I just say this is not to do so much with skill, but to do with luck. You may say that, but nobody believes you. <laughs> it's entirely okay. to do with skill. OK, you start the next word. Well, it's one more round. OK. Um, L. I. N. Um, S. Lawrence. L -I -L -I -N -S. L-I-L-I-N-S. Come on, Lawrence. We're doing well with this one. I think I know what letter you want to give us. Is it the first? A, B, C, D. Or is it the fifth letter of the alphabet? No, stop it. That's not fair. So I've, I've set myself up again, haven't I? You have. <laughs> so E... Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> e. What a, what a question. Excellent. Um, M. L I N S E E. What? M. M. Yeah, linseam. Linseam. What's linseam? It's not linseam. Is not is not a word in itself. It's uh, linseamingly. Oh, what does it mean? <laughs> it means when you look a bit like Lin. Like what? Lin? <laughs> this is prize cheating. <laughs> Honestly, I have the only thing in front of me. It confirms. So that's how they do it. Like old. <laughs> Lynn seemingly is not only have we discovered that the world's leading lexicographer <laughs> can't win a simple Victorian children's word game. We find that to do so, she tries to cheat. Yeah. I mean, this is a. Porn. But you know, I have the power to enter words into the dictionary, which I just have. So Lynn seemingly yeah. is in. Okay. So quickly, Giles, I'm going to say we are all now D O N K E. It's sudden death. Susie, Good. you can start. This is for the win, the Christmas New Year win. It's okay. dealer's choice. What do you want to go for? I just think you guys have already plotted how you're going to set me up. So um, I'm going to go with A. I'm going to go with C. C. E. N. Lawrence. You've got to be clearer than that, Susie. N's quite a good one, though. Giles, where are you going to go it's with a good, this? It's a very good one. I'm going to concede... Accent. I'm giving tea. So sudden death. So what happens? Our saved... listeners missed all the bit that we cut out where I did amazingly well, and Giles is oh, now yes. the donkey. <laughs> <laughs> Giles is now well the donkey. Well done. Before we lose you, Lawrence, let's say yeah. thank you to you and your team and all the people at Something Else for uh, all the good work you've done this year, yes. bringing 
our podcast to the world. Well, thank you so Agreed. much. It's a privilege to work on and thank you to, to you guys. Happy Christmas to everybody. And I'm just thankful I'm not the um, not the donkey this time. No, no I'm, I'm proud to be the donkey. It's not a bad thing to be. Lovely. Well done. Susie, Bye. before we take a break, yes. I'm going to give you just one more game that people can, that you can actually ponder over the break. Okay. And then we can Shit. give the answers at the back of the break. It, again, it's, a, it's an old game that people have been playing for years, but it's quite fun to do. It's how you turn one word into another word. It was very popular with Lewis Carroll, the mm -hmm. creator of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. He would turn wet into dry, one step at a time, one letter at a time. Uh -huh. So you take the word wet, not he'd then give you bet. <laughs> he'd give you the word bay, B-E-Y. What is bay? Is that a colour? B-E-Y. Yes, uh, it is a word, isn't it? Yes, it's a Turkish governor of a province or district. I mean, you'd be forgiven Good. for not knowing that one. Then he went to die, D-E-Y. What's a D-E-Y? D-E-Y? Lewis, honestly, where were you going with all of these? A woman having charge of a dairy. There you are. And then you got to dry. So you can That's get to tough. wet to dry in three steps. Wet, bet, babe, day, dry. And I go to sleep at night, wow. turning hair into soup, pity into good, poor into rich, tree into wood. In a moment, we're going to explore the words of the year. But first, we're just playing a little word game. It's a Victorian word game that I love, that I discovered because it was much loved by Lewis Carroll. I don't know that he was the inventor of it, but he used to enjoy, for example, turning pig into sty. But even not, you can get from cane to able. Cane, chin, shin, spin, spun, spud, sped, aped. Oh. A-P-E-D. Do you know what aped means? Um, is oh, that... aped. What am I saying? It means aped. <laughs> aped. <laughs> Donkey. <laughs> oh, dear, I've been in the Christmas sherry. And from aped to abed to able. So you go from cane to able. It's quite fun. You can go from flour to bread. Flour, floor, flood, blood, brood, broad, bread. It's a fun game to play. So the idea is you simply take two words of the same length and you turn one into the other. So that's what I'm saying. If you happen to be uh, alone or just taking a walk on your own, for the rest of the walk, when our podcast is over, feel free to um, just take two words and see if you can connect them. Make eel turn into pie, oat into rye, or even better, ape into man. Can it be done? So those are some of my games. But one of the games that people have been playing in the newspapers and all the dictionary makers have been playing is Word of the Year. Mm -hmm. uh, this is something that every dictionary company in the world, Merriam-Webster, Oxford English Dictionary, Collins, they all decide what they think is the Word of the Year, often based on the number of times it's been searched in a search engine. And this last year has given us so many words, hasn't it? It has. I, I've, been make, I've been making lists of them. Have you? Yes. Uh, it's quite fascinating, actually. And just to correct you, it's not so much words that have been looked up in a search engine, although obviously, ah. that no, that is relevant. But what lexicographers use are these vast databases of language. So the Oxford English Corpus, as they're called, which just means a database of, of language, is 11 billion words uh, oh at the goodness. moment and uh, uh you know and it's still going up and so we study these to see which words are bubbling under which words have exploded through the surface of the water and which ones are slowly sinking and it's fascinating to watch but for me what was more fascinating was that this year for the first time i think that certainly in my living memory that Oxford published its word of the year. In fact, it found it impossible to choose because 2020 has been such a tumultuous or you know, the word that seemed to shoe in in April, uh, I thought it's got to be the word of the year, unprecedented. Um, it's been such an unprecedented year that actually they couldn't choose just one. And so they chose a whole raft and issued a really fascinating language report on the words that have really come to the fore this year in words that we couldn't possibly have anticipated. So, um, yeah, it's been quite something linguistically. I think I mentioned people looking up words because one of the dictionaries, not the Oxford Dictionary, told us that the word lockdown, which of course has been Collins, in existence yeah. for a long time, mm. it was Collins, uh, had been searched for 4,000 times last year, but more than a quarter of a million times this year. Yeah. And other words that people already knew, like furlough, key worker, self-isolation, they already existed, yeah. but they were came into 
more familiar currency yeah. than ever before. How old is social distancing as a phrase? Social distancing, I think, was was kind of used by virologists, virologists um, in the 60s, um, but it's certainly been used before now of, first of all, people that just wanted to keep apart from others, but in terms of, you know, outbreaks and illness, probably since the big sort of flu epidemic, so maybe kind of the 80s, 1980s onwards. I mean, not massively long, certainly not as long as number one. So we've drawn up our own list, haven't we, Giles? We have we drawn have. up the purple words of the year that for us have some kind of resonance for the year that's just gone and that we felt was sort of deserving of mention. And number one is the word quarantine. And that is a word with real history. And we've talked before about how there is some comfort in the fact that these words have been around and people have needed to use them because of the challenges that they faced and they've gained new currency, but, you know, they're, they're not new and we have dealt with these things before, however painful it is. So quarantine looks back to the days of the Black Death when in Venice boats and ships arriving were required to anchor for 40 days before their crews could come on shore and the Venetian dialect word for 40 was quarantina, 40 days, and that gave us our modern quarantine. Quarantine had been in use long before then as well in religious contexts, etc. But our modern sense of isolating through, you know, because of exposure to illness is from the Black Death. That's our number one. Not that we're including these in the list, but I've liked the variants that people have given us on quarantine, the fun yeah. they've had with it. I liked people talking about uh, drinks that they were having, uh, during the early mm -hmm. days of lockdown, when people were zooming one another for quarantinis. Yes, experimental uh, cocktails. Of, experimental cocktails. They called them quarantinis. And I like, too, the description of teenagers in the time of the COVID-19 lockdown being known as quarantines. Ah, uh, nice. And, and babies born during this time were the coronials. I think that's that's clever. Coronials, quarantinis. Yeah. And, and also, speaking of people having drinks, it was called the locktail. The locktail hour. Ah, uh, Nice. Well, number two on our list is sort of yes. quite similar in that we decided that, you know, things were pretty grim and that actually it was time for a little bit of wordplay, quarantini being a great example, but time to sort of slightly lighten things up a little bit, but also try to, you know, to deal with the realities that we were facing, not just one, but several. So the Corona Coaster is what we have all been riding this year. Mm. That's number two on our list, a Corona Coaster. So there have been variations too using the word Corona. Corona means crown. Yes. And the virus is called the coronavirus yes. because it the actual thing mm -hmm. looks like a crown. That's well, the it's got yes, it's word. got like um it's got a because a corona can also be relating to the solar eclipse. So when it's looked at through um a microscope, it looks like it has a sort of corona around it. So yes, um and you know Corona, the coronavirus, actually has relatives in coronation and, and other things to do with the crown. Just remind everybody of the origins of the very word COVID-19. Yes. It's funny, isn't it? Because you you wanted in some ways to put this on the list because nobody really knows what the D means. And that's absolutely right. I never thought about that before. So you tell us. Well, essentially, it's an abbreviation of coronavirus, disease and 2019. Yeah. So it's three elements, uh, coronavirus, disease and the year. So uh, that gives us covid and 2019. So there you are. Do you know, there's and, just one other word that I probably would yeah. have would have put on my list. And in fact, if I had to choose an official dictionary word of the year, I might well have gone for this one, 2020 itself, because the date has become shorthand for anything that's oh. kind of crazy, mad, ludicrous, unexpected, tragic. People say that's so 2020. Oh, that's very good. Yeah. Well, that could be. Should we, we make we that number 11? That. We might. I think we have to add that to our list. Okay. I think we definitely do. We'll come back because because in a moment when we move on from uh, COVID nineteen, we shall be discovering other things that are so twenty twenty. Yeah. Maybe people will look back on this with some nostalgia, oh. a feeling of nostalgia for the lockdown. Wow. I mean, there were the early lockdown. I rather liked in mm. the early days when we were just walk, walking about and there were no aeroplanes. We were listening to the birds. Yeah. And I also quarantine being our number one word, I love the phrase quarantine, or rather the word quarantine, for people who've pulled together through the crisis. Mm -hmm. They've been a quarantine. 
And actually, you mentioned no air, no planes, less pollution, etc. There was one of the very few new words to emerge this year, actually, that made Oxford's list was anthropause. And anthropause is a mix of anthropo, meaning man or human, and pause, as in, you know, things just stopped and man and nature had time to breathe. Anthropause. What about COVID idiots? That yes. became... That's gone into the dictionary, in fact. That's what, well, that word went in extremely quickly. Uh, and why is that? I mean, it's obviously used everywhere, and I suppose people need to know what it means. That's why it's in the dictionary. Yes. And COVID idiots are, they can be anything, really, can't they? They're the people who disagree with you, basically, are called a COVID idiot. Or the idiot. people that basically it... just ignored all the official guidance uh... and just went about, I mean, it, that links into another one which didn't make our list and actually was, again, tongue-in-cheek because we needed a bit of lightness, and that was a clap hazard, somebody who stood far too close to you when clapping the NHS. Yes, I thought when I first saw that it was somebody who got a venereal disease by mistake, <laughs> a clap hazard, but it, uh, something different. I'm interested that we decided in the end to avoid Zoom. Hmm. But the truth is, Zoom has now become like Google or Hoover, one of those words that used to be attached to a product, but actually now means something beyond that. What's, what's that? What is the phrase for taking a word and making it? into another word, like like Hoover. Yeah, there is, is, a, word there is a word called genericide, which is Thank actually you. almost sort of death to the product by the fact that it becomes generic. Um, but that's slightly technical. I'm, I'm not sure that's the kind of main word. But yes, it's, it's, it does become generic. And a trademark sort of loses its grip and then becomes, you know, very much a kind of mainstream word. And of course, it then loses its capital letter. So at the moment with Google, we're in the strange position where Google, the search engine is a capital G, but to Google something has got a lowercase g because it's lost. It's trademark. And if you zoom somebody, are you using a capital Z? We are at the moment. Capital? Yes, the moment. we are. No, I'm loving the lockdown lingo. What about the, the coffin dodger? In the early days, people were avoiding people with coughs. They were coughing oh, dodgers. Oh, coughing dodgers. And phrases like um, when we were supposed to be flattening the curve, people said, well, actually, what I'm doing is fattening the curve because we were drinking the cocktails and eating at home. Yes, yes, I know. People talked about COVID-24 or something with the number of pounds that they put on. Um, th that's for sure. You know, one of the things that I also found really interesting is that we suddenly had to become really conversant in epidemio epidemiology. So uh, we were talking about our numbers and herd immunity and community yeah. transmission and, and all of that. Furlough as well. You know, we suddenly had to deal with these new realities, furlough being an old term, but, you know, it came, came and meant something very different for us. And then we began drinking Ferlo Merlo. Ferlo Merlo. I mean, I think that what is wonderful about this, given that we talk about language, is how in a year, not only has have these real words come to the fore, but also people with their love of language have used it to create all sorts of fun words. You know, with the masks that we wear, people have talked about mascara, yes. making up your eyes, especially so that you look good with the mask. Um, which I think is rather marvellous. Yeah. Um, no, we definitely tried to introduce a bit of light into the gloom, didn't we? And, and we always uh, do that. And have you heard about people doom scrolling? Yes, yes, Look, I doom scroll all news. the time. Well, we didn't and have much you? choice. Oh, doom surfing. I, I found it quite easy to avoid, actually. Did you? I've, I've, yes, I found it really I think people had to, to be very disciplined about only looking at the news once a day, otherwise you were just inundated. But yes, most of us, I think, were doom scrolling. We've chosen Quarantine and Corona Coaster. I put in a late bid for Bubble, only because Bubble, I just like as a word, it sounds good. Yeah. And it's been a positive part of it because we've been having fun with people in our bubble. Clearly, you've had enough of talking about furlough, free work, <laughs> social distancing, self-isolation and all the rest. You've had enough of lockdown lingo. Uh, I can't get enough of it. You want to talk politics. But I think because I've been a politician... Mm. I try to avoid talking about politics. So you can take us through the words that have a political vibe that you feel have had resonance this year. Some of them are words, ancient words, aren't they? Yeah, I think it's important that it's not that our words of the year or any words of the year list is not just about the pandemic. It, you know, it's overwhelming it is, it has, as it has been. And, you know, the reason 2020 itself has become the shorthand is because we've had so many other things. We've had wildfires, which have totally 
desecrated and destroyed so much of our land. Um, we've had acute racial injustice. We've had racial protests. We've had a savage economic recession. We've had a pivotal US election. You know, there's, there's just been so much of it. So, yes, turning to political... Talk about doom scrolling. Here she is. <laughs> um, Little New Year chair from Susie Dent. It's hard to find some light, isn't it? it? It is hard. And that's what Oxford was saying, I think, is that normally they would have a few sort of techie things on their list or whatever. And this year it was very, very hard to find the light. And I think that light, as you say, came from us playing around with existing words and coming up with some funny ones. OK, so number three on our list is empleomania. Oh, it's a lovely word. Very old word, this. If How you, do you spell it? E-M-P-L-E-O-M-A-N-I-A. Mm -hmm. If you're an empleomaniac, you have a desire or a thirst for public office, no matter what the cost. Mm. So this, of course, for me, now our purple listeners will probably know that Giles and I don't exactly totally share the same um, political views. But this for me, I think you can probably agree on this one, Giles. Donald Trump. He wanted to cling on to office no matter what because his thirst for public office was so huge. So for me, Donald Trump is the ultimate empleomaniac. It's a great word. You say it's a very old word. How old is it? Um, empleomania, I think, will take us back to about the 18th century. So although it's Latin, um, in you know, in those days, we have a great desire to kind of sound more classical and more impressive by looking to the languages of the ancients. I'm just looking at it now. Yeah, 1845. So the 1800s we're looking at there. Very good. Um, OK, so this this, again, I mean, no matter what your political persuasion, I think you can find individuals that fit this description number four on our list um whether you're what, what country you're in um or it doesn't have to be a political word actually it can be for somebody in your office or somebody in your family a catch fart catch fart once applied to a lackey a servant who was never too far behind their master or mistress and so who always followed the political wind a catch fart in other words they were so close that they got <laughs> they got everything a, and they blew with the political wind and i think you read the newspapers too much or watch too much television. Oh, I've, I've been fascinated by the u.s election that i was just overjoyed at the result i've been very blatant here explicit about my views a stiff rump Again, mm -hmm. everything I just said about catch fart still applies to this. You can apply it to anyone you, you like, really. A stiff rump, all of these are really old epithets, by the way. Stiff rump is a stubborn individual who resolutely refuses to budge. Very good. These words are so rich and so applicable to the human condition that I think we will all know an empleomaniac, a catch fart or a stiff rump, no matter what your political persuasion. Have you got some more going back, as it were, to the, the lockdown, isolation mm. world in which we've been? Have you got some more words from from that area? Well, yes. I te oh, I'll tell you what, what, what's obsessed me this year has been homeschooling. Yes. Not that I've done any. I yes. tried to do some with my grandchildren. Hopeless, absolutely hopeless. I'm no good at it. Makes me realise how amazing the teachers are. Homeschooling, I horror think, word of the year. It's strange that actually not... But not that I know of anyway. No words really came out of that horrible dilemma that most parents, you know, face with having to work at the same time as homeschooling their kids. I mean, you know, what a tricky, tough time uh, that was. And yet we didn't seem to have any words that came out of that. Perhaps we did. If any of our purple listeners have heard some, I'd love to hear them. Um, but yes, I've got some words that weren't created in 2020 to describe the new reality, but actually that I think we can take from the corners of the dictionary, from the historical dictionary, because they do articulate some of the experiences we've been having. So for me, number six on our list kind of summed up what I felt like doing after too much doom scrolling, and that is to litibulate. And mm. to, lib to litibulate is to hide in a corner in an attempt to escape reality. Oh, I love that. Yeah. When it's we a useful word anyway, much. isn't it? Mm. Litibulate. I think I've spent the whole of my life litibulating. Oh, well, you're in a corner now, actually, looking at you on Zoom. You're in a corner. Yes, I like being in a... I want to be in a cosy corner <laughs> with a lot of books, actually. Um, and number seven, again, not dissimilar, really. While you were tib latibulating, you might have felt this. I hope you don't mind me putting a German word on the list. And it's Fernweh. Fernweh. So poetic in German. It's spelled F-E-R-N-W-E-H. And it means the longing to be far away. You say it's a German word, and of course it is. But the joy of the English language is it is the most international language in the history of language, isn't it? it is. We have taken words from 
every country under the sun. Yes. And it's wonderful that we should do so. Fernweh. Totally. And how do you, how, is it, I mean, it's a German word, mm. but is it used in English? Has it, I mean, has it got any um, history of being used in English? No, not yet. It's funny, isn't it? We're quite restrictive when it comes to German words. We always say, oh, there must be a German word for that. But there are only a few that we take in, Schadenfreude being the obvious one, um, Wanderlust, Wunderkind is another one. Um, so we take selectively from German, perhaps because of our kind of troubled history with it. But we, but I think we do really admire the language for being so like Lego. Hmm. If you could be, and if you could be far away from wherever you are now, which is Oxford, mm. if travel was not a problem at the moment, if COVID-19 didn't exist, where would you be far away today? I'd either As be on the country. west coast of Ireland uh, ah. or I would be down near my father, which is near, um, actually, I don't miss my mum and my dad so much. So it'd be a cross between Wiltshire, where my mum is, and Devon, where my dad is, just by the sea. Um, in my mind's eye, I might like to go to the Maldives or something, but, you know, those would do me fine. Yeah. How about you? In the past, I have several times been lucky enough to spend Christmas, New Year in Jamaica. Lovely. I love the Caribbean and I love Jamaica. I love the people. I love the look of the country. I love its heritage, its cultural heritage with people like Bob Marley and also its imported cultural heritage with people like Ian Fleming and Noel Card, mm. who chose to live Golden in Eye. Jamaica. Golden Eye is there. That was the name of his uh, house, wasn't it? Was in indeed. I've stayed. I've stayed there. Have you? It's absolutely fabulous. It's now been built up into a sort of resort hotel, oh. but his essential house is still there. And I had a wonderful experience when I was last in Jamaica, standing on the beach, looking out over the sea, lovely golden sand. And this little old lady came along the beach. This little wizened old lady, nut brown, bent double. This little figure came teetering along the beach towards us. My wife and I were standing. And it wasn't until this little old lady got right up in front of us, we realised it was actually Mick Jagger. Oh, wow. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah. <laughs> so the you do meet extraordinary lead, people. Giles. I know. It's, it's all right for some. It is all right for some. Well, look, there's hope for next year, I hope. Word number eight. Fathom. Yes. Why have you got that on? Okay, that seems an odd one, doesn't it? I chose fathom because it has two meanings, really. One is a fathom is a, you know, used to refer to the depth of water. So it's about six feet, 1.8 metres. So that's its nautical sense. But also when we try to fathom something, we are trying to measure the depth of it in a metaphorical sense to understand it and to, and to sort of think it through. But I love the fact that we had that. We were all trying to fathom this new situation that we had to deal with. But also the original sense, the one that gave us both the measurement and the idea of trying to encompass something in our heads is fathom, meaning the outstretched arms. So it was something which embraces. Oh. So it was a unit of measurement that was based on the span of your outstretched arms. So we longed to embrace people this year. We longed to touch them. We longed to hug them. And we couldn't. So for me, that word has just packed such a punch that we were trying to fathom in every single sense. Lovely. Uh, hope, actually, is my favourite four-letter word. Have you got some words that you think should be words of the year that give us hope? Yes. Well, number nine on our list. It's just been a, a favourite word of mine for such a long time and I can never understand why there's only one record of it in the Oxford English Dictionary and the editors aren't even completely sure because they've only found this one instance of exactly what it means, but it's just got such a a lovely feel to it. So it's the opposite of despair. I think it's been one of my trio at times. And it's respair. And respair mm. is defined simply as fresh hope, a recovery from despair, which I just think oh, is Oh, I love beautiful. that. Respair. Let's hope for respair this year. And number 10, well, we mentioned German. My other language, favourite language, is slightly subjective. And I know there'll be so many words that the purple people would want to add to our list. And we would welcome hearing them. But number 10 for me is a French word, retrouvaille, retrouvaille. And it's R-E-T-R-O-U-V-A-I-L-L-E-S, retrouvaille. And it simply means the joy of reunion, the joy of reuniting with someone, which is something, as I say, we just all long for. That's wonderful. Mm. Well done. Thank you very much. So those are our 11 words of the year. I'm putting 2020 at the top of the list because I think it sums it all up. Yeah. And I think people are going to talk about this year for years to come, aren't they? I think they it's will. It's going to be like 1776 or 1066. Yes. I'm hoping when we come out of this, there were the roaring 20s and the 1920s when people decided after the 
horrors of the Great War that they were going to celebrate, come what may. And we had the Flappers, we had the Charleston, we had Bebop. Uh, we're going to be having fun times. Exuberance, in the that's 20s. what we want. That's what we want. Yes. We want respect, retrouvailles, exuberance, happiness. Yay! That's what we want. <laughs> Goodbye, 2020. Hello, 2021. Yes. To take us into the new year, have you got your three words of the week? I do. What would they be? And they're just plucked out of thin air, really. They don't have any particular uh, meaning. I just like the sound of them. What One is appropriate again for sort of looking at someone from afar longing to give them a hug and actually being unable to it's belgard belgard from french but it came into english a long time ago b-e-l-g-a-r-d and it simply means a loving look a belgard i love that which is gorgeous now if you're loquacious and like I like using words a lot and you could be slightly verbose with it. You know, loquaciousness, it doesn't necessarily have a very positive ring to it, but I like... Is the, is the correct word loquacity or is both, it actually, Both of them are in the dictionary, yeah. Fine. But I'm going to give you an alternative and one that I think sounds much more, much smoother. And I'd like to think that this applies to purple, even if it might have a slight verbosity about it. It's linguosity. Linguosity means sort of... Liking to use words, a, a, a pleasure in using words, but perhaps a little bit too much linguosity, which I just think yeah. is quite nice. I may be guilty of that at times, you know. Are you? Well, we I'm all are. Um, and I'm going to finish with one that I think just sums up the year for many of us. And, you know, this will be gone, I promise, once respair arrives. But if you are beblubbered, beblubbered means having swollen eyes from too much crying. You're beblubbered. I just like the sound of that, yes. Don't be so beblubbered. Respair is around the corner. We don't want people being beblubbered. We want people full of hope, full of respair. Yes. Okay, that's going to be... Oh, I like the French twist you gave that one. (laughs) Respair. But you're right, it comes from espair to hope. Yeah, it's, it's all linked, all linked together. Susie, we've reached the end of the year and it's been a fabulous year for us and for Something Rhymes With Purple. We do so want to say thank you to everybody for listening. Thank you for spreading the word. Thank you for helping us become the best entertainment podcast of 2020. That's been fantastic. It has been. I want to say to everybody all over the world, cheers. So cheers. Santé. À la vôtre. Salut. Prost. Yamas. Do you know where they say yamas? No. Susie? It's in Greece that they say yamas. Nice. Gesundheit. Do they say that in Germany? Gesundheit. Yes. Gesundheit. Yeah. Health. Very good. Yeah. Where do they say biba? Do you know? Spain? Biba. No, Guam. Oh, Maybe my Spanish goodness. One. I don't know yeah. any of these. What about in China? What do they say in China? No idea. Uh, we don't. We have listeners in China. We know you're there. We know you're listening. Hi, yes. <laughs> uh, they say they're Ganbei. What about this oh, one? Oh, nice. Naz, Nazdravi. Nazdravi? That's cheers in Croatian and I think in Czech. Skull, everyone knows that. What about Tervisex? That, I think, is cheers in Estonian. I mentioned the other day, Kip Piss, which I think is cheers in Finnish. I love that. Chin Chin, where does that come from? Chin Chin, well, Italy, we use it of course. Italy, yeah, but we use it. Chin Chin is Italy. We've adapted it from Italy. Cheerio okay. Chin Chin. Oh, yeah, nice. that's what they say in Italy now, yeah. Uh, Chokdi comes from Thailand. Yeah. And my favourite, I think it comes from... The part of the world, Vietnam, Cambodia, around there. Yeah. Yonzo mot hai ba yo. One, two, three, yo. Excellent. So that's us greeting our listeners around the world. And I'm full of hope. And so the poem I'm going to share with you this week comes from Pippa Passes by Robert Browning, a great Victorian writer, hugely famous poet in his day. And it really, well, it gives us hope. It reminds us that spring is around the corner. The years at the spring and days at the morn. Mornings at seven, the hillsides dew pearled, the larks on the wing, the snails on the thorn. God's in his heaven, all's right with the world. That is so beautiful and just the loveliest way to end what's been a really tricky 2020, our our word of the year. Thank you, Giles. Thank you to all the Purple listeners, genuinely, from from me too. Um, It means, means the world to us that you have been with us this year, of all years. Something Rhymes With Purple, though, is a Something Else production. We have so many people helping us make it. It was produced by Lawrence Bassett with additional production from Harriet Wells, Steve Ackerman, Ella McLeod, Jay Beale, and the infamous, if sometimes invisible, Gully. Kip piss to you, Gully. <laughs>